Thank you so much again for joining Will. And it's been it's always a pleasure to have you at these workshops. And we're very excited for your talk. Thanks. Thanks. I'm going to be telling you about our work in crisscross polymerization led by talented junior investigators. Two of them are here, Chris Wintersinger and Anastasia Ersheva. Uh, third key contributor, Dio Minov, was a former Foresight Fellow. And then we also have Jia Dong, who just took a faculty position in Wuhan. And I'll be telling you about a reminder of what, we talked, what I talked about last year of building what we call megastructures from building blocks that are DNA origami. And then I'll be sharing very briefly some exciting advances that Anastasia led in trying to get exponential growth from single-stranded slots. And the starting point is thinking about DNA origami. And what I love the most about DNA origami is that you have absolute control over the number of structures that form based on the number of scaffold strands that you add. But what if you wanted to build structures that are far bigger than a scaffold? Because the problem is that um, with DNA origami, half the mass has to be the scaffold. And so that's the problem we set out to solve. Why would you want to do that? Well, we can envision a future where we can program the self-assembly of squishy robots the sizes of a cell that might be a million times bigger than an individual DNA origami. We don't have a scaffold half the size of a cell. On, contrarily, on, another point is we would like to be able to uh, build ultra-sensitive enzyme-free diagnostics. We're trying to convert a single analyte into vast polymerization of single-stranded building blocks into double-stranded products. So build a lot of material for amplification. And again, uh, this is something beyond the capability of conventional DNA origami. So I'm going to introduce this, this uh, concept of crisscross polymerization, where the goal is to program some kind of building block that's thermodyna thermodynamically specified to assemble into desired shape, but is completely blocked kinetically from ever doing so, except when you add a small seed that is much tinier than the final assembly. And so the basic ingredient is specification is you have a building block that are these elongated slats with many specific glues on them. In this case, these are DNA origami slats. Each one of these long things is one DNA origami. It has 32 sequence specific glues on it. We program them so that they can make interactions with each other at roughly 90 degrees. And it's programmed in the final assembly to have 32 neighbors. But it can only make a contact, one contact with any one neighbor. Importantly, we operate this at a temperature where you need close to half of the bonds, or 16 in this case, for stable assembly. So if you only made eight bonds or nine bonds, it'll transiently come together, and then it'll fall apart. And that's really the key why this, uh, uh, designing a process that will never, ever start kinetically, even though it's favored thermodynamically. So we can imagine a growth trajectory where we have two slats come together. The energy deficit is represented. One represents the cost. One unit is the cost of fixing one of those building blocks into exactly the right position entropically. And so just bringing two things together, it's making only one bond. Well, that's, that's not favored, so that's, gonna fall, that's very unstable. But what's even more unstable is trying to add two more slats, because every time you add another slat, you're making fewer than those 16 bonds. So you're just writing up the energy landscape, climbing Mount Improbable, you might, might call it, um, to make successively un more preposterously unlikely structures, until you finally get to this structure we call the critical nucleus, where finally, once you achieve this mountain peak, you can start adding building blocks where each added building block is making 16 bonds and therefore is stable. But the situation is to get to this peak, we need to climb an energy barrier of 16 units. In other words, the entropic price of fixing 16 building blocks in exactly the right orientation without anything to hold them together, which will basically, you could fill the ocean with these things and then wait the age of the universe. It's just not going to happen as long as you're close to that reversible temperature. And then that buys us the opportunity to control this process by putting in a little uh, deus ex machina, a single DNA origami seed that's using very strong bonds to position those first 16 horizontal structures. It pays that entropic price, and now the process can go off and running, where we can imagine starting with this bidirectional growth front, we are adding 16 slats at a time, and then we can tile around into some desired structure. And so we can see a transmission electron micrograph here of an object approaching a micrometer in scale with 192 origami. Um, we published this work in Nature and Nanotechnology. Anastasia designed this beautiful cover. Um, so these structures are made from over 1,000 DNA origami. Each are different. Overall dimensions of two microns by two microns. And we're we're, right now, we're working on trying to extend this to make it 
in more order of magnitude bigger, or maybe two orders of magnitude bigger, try to make 3D. I don't have time to go into those details right now. I'm happy to talk about it later. I just want to briefly point out, I, I stuck this into one of the working documents, this idea of how to use crisscross for implosion. So I'm, I'm not really going to talk about it here. I'm just going to briefly mention that the point of this is that it's how do you build pre-assembled three to five nanometer building blocks into much bigger structures, if that's what you want. This is agnostic about how you make those smaller building blocks. It's really about that next step. And so now I'd like to briefly talk about um, crisscross with single-stranded building blocks for the purpose of signal amplification for diagnostics. And with, you can repeat this crisscross process with the same advantages of kinetic blockade, but with now tiny, tiny building blocks that are just oligonucleotides. And the oligonucleotides are just binding to each other with half a turn. That's one binding site. And it's the same process where we specify that at equilibrium, all the binding sites are occupied by a bunch of different um, binding partners, but that kinetically it never gets off the, off the starting point because of this entropic barrier. So you're writing up this climbing mountain improbable, and it's so rare to get to the peak that this process basically never happens. But now we have single-stranded building blocks, so the assembly can happen much more quickly. We can have these building blocks at very high concentration. And again, we, if we introduce a seed that somehow is linked to the analyte that we're trying to detect, in this case, a DNA origami, then we can trigger the process in a controlled fashion so it nucleates the assembly, and then it grows. We have way, ideas of how to, how to convert any analyte into such a seed. Happy to talk about it later. And uh, really, the, the um, brand new idea that Anastasia has been developing that we're very excited about is, um, how do we actually get this to grow not just linearly, but ex exponentially? It turns out linear growth is too slow in order to get trillion-fold amplification. And so the scheme, we came up with a, a strand displacement-based scheme in order to cut these thick filaments. And that might sound very difficult, but we figured out a scheme that works. And it's based on this notion of toehold mediated strand displacement that many of you might be familiar with, that uh, you, can, you can think of this as how do we break the blue and the black strands apart? That's kind of cutting this into two pieces. And the way that we do this is by introducing a single-stranded toehold that the displacing strand can grab onto to nucleate, undergo branch migration, and kick the black off. This is how we split the uh, blue and black into two strands. And then in this case, in the middle, is taking this analogy with one of our crisscross structures. So here we're asking the green strand in, in this middle thing to come in and displace the top slat away. And so it kind of comes in. And um, I don't, I'm not going to describe this in great detail, but hopefully you can kind of see what's going with the analogy between the middle and the top. I'm happy to talk about it later. And then here's kind of the um, mind bender, is we can extend the process to now involve coordinated strand displacement by a set of these invader strands that coordinate in a way to basically separate the bottom block from the northeast block. And in that way, we can have coordinated attack by many invader strands and then split this very, very uh, thick object into two. And then we can incorporate that into our uh, crisscross growth model where we're making these linear ribbons. We introduce these coordinated toe holds so you have a bunch of invader strands that can eat in from the, the north and from the east. And if you have invasion on two fronts, then you can basically get this thing to split Anastasia made a nice animation showing this process. Um, again, I can, we can, um, you can download it from the, the Google Doc if you want to look at this in more detail. And in that way, we can get exponential amplification. Um, and it kind of works, but we're still trying to improve on its performance. Uh, the latest is we have some kind of variant where we can get down to subatomal or limited detection, which we're very excited about. So in summary, this is a scheme with the single-stranded building blocks that we think will be extremely useful for enzyme-free, ultra-sensitive uh, detection of things like pathogens, especially in the, the developing world. And I'll conclude by just reminding again that here, specifically, we're looking at how do we implement exponential conversion of single-stranded building blocks into double-stranded products for the purpose of diagnostics. But on another scale, we're longitudinally interested, how do we advance the field of biomolecular nanotechnology to sustain an exponential trend in the maximum complexity of the structures that we can construct over time. And then another thing I'd just like to point out is that nothing in our crisscross uh, cartoons has anything to do with DNA. We implemented this with single-stranded DNA. We implemented it with DNA origami building blocks. We challenged people in the community to repeat this algorithm with other materials, such as proteins, or maybe non-biological polymers as well. So thanks. Interesting. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one question.
really, really simple question, particularly related to the last point. So how does one of your deficit units compare to KT? How does what? So you, you had your energy deficit yeah. units. Oh, when, when how do they compare to KT? Yeah, so if you imagine, your, let's say your building blocks were at one micromolar concentration, and then the effective concentration within the ribbon, let's just say for argument's sake it's one molar. So that's a six order of magnitude concentration to pull it out of micromolar bulk solution into the, into the ribbon. And so each order of magnitude corresponds to 2.3 kT. So if, you're, if you have, in the case of the origami, if there's 16, so 16 units, 16 times 2.3 is like 38 kT. That's huge. That's like two ATPs worth of energy. It's never going to happen. It's not going to happen. So how do you think that your work could fit into the respective architecture? Yeah, so I have this figure that I embedded in the work, yeah. <laughs> the work piece. And, um, and also, it's here. You can download it. And um, yeah, so this, again, this is a scheme for making an exploded view of pre-assembled 3 to 5 nanometer building blocks that each would fit on the node on the uh, crisscross grid. And, and then what the advantage here is that you could hierarchically construct each slat with, let's say, 32 guests on it. So you have some kind of, first you have some kind of mechanism. Your first level printer makes your three to five nanometer building blocks. Then your second level process fabricates the slats with 32 of them loaded up in a linear fashion. This is the third step, where we now assemble those 32 subunits together into a much bigger structure in an exploded view. And then we can also do funny, we have more access in this exploded view. And then when we're ready, we could program it to compact along the y-axis. So this is just like a little grid structure. You can, hopefully, we've all seen these kind of like the boxing glove thing that expands and contracts. So contract in the y-axis. And then what we do is we remove the DNA scaffold. And we've, we've uh, also inserted some rubber bands along the orthogonal axis. So in a second step, we can take the structure that's only cross-linked along the, the y-axis and then we can compact it along the x-axis as well. It's probably confusing, but happy to talk about it more later. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Phil.